Good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the New York Public Library. I am welcoming you whether you are here in person or visiting us virtually this evening. We have uh, quite a robust online presence this evening. I'm Martha Hodes. I am serving as interim director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. And let me just make a few announcements before we begin. Um, first of all, this event is being recorded, just so you know. Um, for those of you here with us, if you would like a mask and you don't have one, we have some to give away, so feel free to just signal and we'll give you one. Um, for virtual attenders, real-time captions are available by clicking on the closed caption button, or if you would like a live transcript, use the stream text link shared in the reminder email or chat. This evening, we come together to continue our wonderful winter series of conversations from the Coleman Center. We are presenting Coleman Fellow Hilary Hallett speaking about her new book, Inventing the It Girl, in conversation with distinguished historian Alice Kessler Harris. If you have an NYPL library card or live in New York State and want to apply for one, you can borrow Inventing the It Girl for free. You can also buy the book from the library <laughs> shop, and our proceeds do benefit the library. Thank you. You can also find links to buy the book on the event page, which is nypl.org slash conversations. Or best of all, you can buy the book and have it signed by Hillary right outside the door after this evening's program. Let me also just say a few words about the Coleman Center. We select 15 fellows each year who come to the library to gain intensive access to our unparalleled collections in order to write the books of tomorrow. Our fellows are among the best and most promising academics and independent scholars, fiction writers and poets, journalists, translators, playwrights, and artists at work today. Writers and scholars from any country are welcome to apply, and the next cycle of applications will be available online in June. You can also see everything the library has to offer by signing up for our newsletter at nypl.org slash connect. And all programs are made possible by the generosity of patrons like you. Now for tonight's program. Our guests will converse for perhaps 35 minutes, then take your questions. For those of you here with us, please write your questions on the cards with the pencil and cards that are on your chairs. And library staff will collect the questions prior to Q&A. If you are joining us virtually, um, please put your question in the chat by, or by emailing culmancenter at nypl.org. And please be sure to do so during the program. Once Q&A has started, we're not able to monitor the questions. And now I would like to introduce our speakers. Hillary's interlocutor this evening is Alice Kessler Harris, Professor Emerita of American History at Columbia University and Professor Emerita at Columbia's Institute for Research on Women and Gender. Alice has won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and is the author of many books. Two of her most recent are In Pursuit of Equity, Women, Men, and the Quest for Economic Citizenship in 20th Century America, and A Difficult Woman, The Challenging Life and Times of Lillian Hellman. Alice speaks tonight with Hilary Hallett, Professor and Director of American Studies and Associate Professor of History at Columbia University, where she teaches courses like American History at the Movies and Gender History and American Film. She's the author of Go West, Young Women, The Rise of Early Hollywood. She's written for the Los Angeles Times and Lit Hub, and she's worked as a historical consultant for film and television, and Hillary was a Coleman Center Fellow in 2016-17. Tonight's book, Inventing the It Girl, How Eleanor Glynn Created the Modern Romance and Conquered Early Hollywood, is an unconventional biography of an unconventional woman. Kirkus Reviews calls it a brilliant, thought-provoking portrait of a forgotten 20th century influencer, a vivacious, intellectual, and fascinating narrative. Publishers Weekly calls it a page-turner and named it a Summer Reads selection and this winter it's our Valentine's Day special. So please join me for a very warm welcome for Alice Kessler-Harris and Hilary Hallett. Uh, 
I suppose I should start this. Thank you, Martha, for that very warm introduction. And thank you, Hillary, for writing a book that I really enjoyed reading. And I, I, ha I have to say that here is a book which I recommend to everybody. It's a book which is filled with paradox. And it's the paradox that makes the book move. Here, after all, is a British, uh, you might call her a lady, although she didn't have the title of lady, but she certainly had aristocratic British upper-class pretensions who made her name and her fortune such as it was as the uh, exponent of sexual desire among women, doing exactly what women had been told not to do. So, Hillary, let me turn to you and say, how did you come across Eleanor Glynn, and why did you start writing about her? It's a great question, Alice, and if, let me just also thank you for joining me. This is, Alice was a mentor of mine at Columbia, and, you know, I knew her work before I joined the faculty there, so it's just wonderful to be here. And, and thank you, Martha, for that introduction. Um, so I came across Eleanor, actually, like at the beginning of it all when I was researching my dissertation because I was actually researching an early film star, Gloria Swanson. Most people know who she is. And she made it really clear that this woman I'd never heard of named Eleanor Glynn, you know, was responsible for her being anointed the first so-called glamour queen uh, in, ho in early Hollywood in the early 1920s. So I was like, who is this woman, right? So like a good graduate student, I went to the secondary literature and, and most of, there was very, very little about her. Uh, but and most of what I found, you know, really was extremely patronizing, you know, and, and sort of derisive it, and, and sort of mocking, you know, this woman with bright red hair, you know, by the time she was in Hollywood, she was older, so she was dyeing her hair. And much of the commentary focused on, you know, her artificial red hair and her... They sort of, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it, it didn't match up with the primary source. So, of course, that provoked my interest. So then I started looking for more primary sources about her. Mm. And what I quickly found was that pretty much everyone thought that she was, you know, the doyenne of early Hollywood, that she was, you know, she would literally walk through parties and pronounce what was glamorous and what was hideous. And people listened to her, right? Um, and she had become, in, an, in a moment when there were quite a number you know, of white women that had a, a significant influence in early Hollywood, nonetheless, she managed to become the star author of the industry within six months of moving there. And she had almost never seen a movie before she arrived. So I was fascinated by her, and she took over a chapter. Uh, and my dissertation advisor at the time said, you know, this is too much Eleanor Glenn for the book, yeah. but, you know, maybe your next book <laughs> will so be about Eleanor was. Glenn. So, yeah, that was kind of, she's been in the back of my mind really since the very beginning. So, uh, Hillary, just before we launch into Eleanor herself, hmm. tell us how you found the sources. I mean, after all, yeah. the book, as you will see if you read it, is full of very intimate statements about her own desires and her relationships with the men and her own family. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you find the sources? To so write this book? yes, I mean, I had the idea that I was fascinated by her and knew that her influence was far greater than anyone had ever given her credit for. Um, but I knew that I also there was an archive. She has an archive that her younger daughter. Juliet, who became you know, quite a figure in her own right, uh, set up after her death at Reading. But from what I could tell online, it was largely a professional archive. And so you know, I went with my family, my children were small, my husband is a British historian and you know, loved the opportunity to go back to England for the summer. So we went for the summer and you know, my goal was to see if I could find the kind of sources to write the kind of biography I wanted to write because my second book, my first book rather, 
I couldn't get inside the people I was writing about very much. I could not get those sources. I could not get access to that. And I didn't want to write another book about those kind of people if I didn't have different kinds of sources, and especially not a biography, mm. right? And so once I realized that the Reading Archive had almost nothing, I mean, it had some useful stuff, but didn't have this other dimension, the private dimension. I started writing to all of her heirs because she had two daughters who had children and they were both, they both married well and they, you know, they're, you know, her, her grandchildren and, you know, her family has continued to do somewhat interesting things. So I knew they were around. One of them actually was a professor at Oxford where we were staying for the summer. Um, so I just started writing to people and explaining who I was and what I was doing. And, you know, I don't know if any of you have researched in Britain, but I think they're a little nicer about it than Americans. <laughs> you know, they're kind of like into scholars and they're really sort of, you know, they, they're flattered by your interest in a way that I don't feel like Americans are, you know. So I was really surprised at the, you know, and then finally though it took finding the right, it was her great granddaughter who literally two weeks before we were set to leave wrote me this email saying, I just received your email, I can't do the accent, you know, she had a very upper crusty accent, but you know, I think I have the documents you're looking for in a trunk in Wales. That was the email, and it was, you know, the remaining diaries, um, and mostly a tremendous number of letters. Mm. It was Wonderful. mostly letters. So, yeah, it was literally a trunk, and I had to photograph them all in a week, because we were returning home. So you were lucky that she wrote a lot of letters. I was so lucky. Right. I, I, I advise everybody here who wants <laughs> to be part of history to start writing letters instead of sending email messages. I know. But Hillary, plunge into Eleanor a little bit. So here she is, long before she went to Hollywood. She was a novelist and a writer in Britain and had achieved a good deal of renown writing books about sexual desire and sexual behavior among women. Talk about how she how started she? to do that. I mean, here's a woman with a, a very conventional, apparently very conventional marriage. Mm -hmm. How does she get away with it? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it was a bit incremental. She doesn't, three weeks is the book the sex novel, right, that was sort of a Fifty Shades of Grey of its day, is the thing I say, um, that she publishes in 1907, but that's her sixth novel. And so she kind of, it's, it's, there's a progression. When she publishes her first novel in 1900, I do think it was m much as a lark. Um, I mean, I think she had sort of a little bit of ambition, but she was depressed, that was definitely clear. And this was an antidote for depression for her. Um, sort of, she'd always been known for being witty and being funny and charming, and she'd always kept, you know, like a lot of women of her class, a diary, and she'd always written sketches in them, which I was able to read, you know. So I know she had interest in being a writer, sort of, but I don't think until you know, 1900, um, you know, she's in her mid-30s at this point, she's had her two kids, she's miserably married, she's realized that, you know, she turns to writing to kind of escape that. And it's a, it's in a lighthearted vein that allows readers to kind of look behind the doors into this world of society that everybody is so fascinated by at that time, right? The aristocratic British set. And she's writing with a very light touch, and she is touching on the fact that this society doesn't follow conventional Victorian morality, but she's doing it with a very light hand. So that if you don't know it, young innocent girls, for instance, you know, who I found readers saying this, like they knew their parents were like, you shouldn't read that book, but when they read it, they didn't understand it yet, right? And so I think it's, she kind of, starts there and then becomes progressively more focused on sexual desire of women specifically, I think because of, frankly, her own frustration sexually, mm -hmm. right? She has a very unhappy marriage. They are completely, it's a total misalliance. 
but she's enough of a kind of conventional, really had more of a middle class upbringing, you know, marries up. She couldn't embrace fully, from what the sources I have, she was not able to initially embrace the more hedonistic ways of this aristocratic set into which she married. But she observed them. She, you know, she didn't really judge them. She didn't have a very moralistic sensibility, but she didn't also fully embrace them. So, Hillary, are you saying that the hedonistic ways of this set, that the upper middle class people with whom she was associating themselves had active sexual lives in the Victorian period? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> But not only that, I mean, it was quite acceptable for married women to have extramarital affairs, specifically. I upper, mean, we upper class for the upper classes, not for ordinary, not people. for ordinary women. No, no, no. But for the, mostly, you know, the aristocratic set, you know, not, you know, not, yes, not ordinary. It was something, though, that was not talked about. It was something that went on behind closed doors. It, or obviously, earlier it had been talked about. You know, people knew that aristocrats didn't follow the same rules as everyone else. But under Victoria's influence in the 19th century and the rise of, you know, evangelical moralism, right, that was something that got pushed behind closed doors. But, but it didn't change that much. And so, yes, she was exposed to, but what she felt like was a very kind of heartless expression of sexual desire quite often. Um, and so I think that there was a tension in her. You said, you know, she is a woman of paradoxes. There was a part of her that was somewhat committed to the idea of romantic love that the middle class valor was, had begun to valorize in, in the novel, for instance. But there was another part of her that was, I think, very tempted by this hedonistic world, this aristocratic set and their mores, but yet couldn't fully go there because it really wasn't her world. I mean, I think it's partially why. So you say in the book that she didn't actually go there until she was in her late 30s. Yeah, she around 40, actually. Around mm -hmm. 40. So she had already raised, more or less, her children. But before she actually went there herself, she was writing about that behavior. Yes. Writing about it as though she, she knew what was going on in these upper class worlds. So I think part of it is her best friend in that world was a woman named Daisy, the Countess of Warwick, who was you know, literally the premier hostess of that era. She was Edward's mistress before he became king for many years, right? She, you know, and so, and this, she loved Daisy. And Daisy, you know, was very, went from lover to lover. You know, the king was one of many. Um, I think, I, I think, so she, I think, you know, she in some ways revered these aristocrats in their ways until she died. Even after they, you know, they ended up, this set mostly ended up ostracizing her after her book Three Weeks. But she continued really in her heart to revere, you know, the aristocracy until she died. I also think, and I got this from Cecil Beaton, Sir Cecil Beaton, the photographer and costume designer, British, um, you know, tastemaker. He, she was apparently a big reader of French pornography. Um, you know what I mean? So I think she, you know, some of it, she was a big reader, you know, this is why it's by the first chapter is in the library. And I do think some of her ideas about sex and romance that were outside the norm of the conventional, you know, Victorian morality, middle class morality that she was raised in came, they were literary, some of them. <laughs> you know, she was a highly imaginative person, clearly, as most writers are. And so I think it was a mix of observation of friends and stories of friends and reading of different kinds of things. And, and how much of it do you think was also the fact that she had been uh, raised in Jersey, uh, that she was the French fluent. Influence. Yeah, her mother had I think French it was huge. family. Yes, that absolutely. She was fluent in French as well as hundred percent. Yes. She, she and she, you know, goes to Paris the first time at 16 and falls in love with Paris, right? And that is a love affair. She loves Paris more than she loves England. Right. She feels in many ways more French than she does British until a certain point in her life, I think. Because 
I mean, I mean, I think some of that, though, again, was somewhat being an outsider to French culture as a young British woman who wasn't really going to marry, you know, a well-placed Frenchman. She was allowed a latitude that most single French women would not have had, you know, in the late 19th century. And if you get that latitude in French culture, their, their theater, their literature was much franker about sex. You know, Sarah Bernhardt was able to perform things that in France all the time that she was literally not allowed to do on the stage in London, right? They had a completely different censorship code. Um, you know, and she wrote, you know, it's a piece in the book. I mean, I, I do think Sarah Bernhardt, you know, inspired her real first sexual awakening, this play she sees of Sarah Bernhardt um, when she's 16. And her she's brought there in part because they don't know how well she speaks French. <laughs> <laughs> so they think she doesn't fully understand what's going on on the stage because it's not appropriate for a 16-year-old girl. Um, and so, yes, I think absolutely you're right. I mean, and in, in, in that library that I was mentioning, she was reading in French in that library. Um, so this, right. this franker attitude towards the body, towards passion, towards sexual desire, right, was allowed in French, in French culture and literature in a way that it wasn't in British culture and literature. So that's one piece, is her own sort of passionate desire to have the kind of sex that she didn't have until perhaps later in her life. Mm -hmm. But talk to us a little bit about how she imagined sex playing in her novels. I mean, I'm uh, moved by the fact that you say several times that she was interested in the romance of love, mm -hmm. that it wasn't the sexual act per se, mm -hmm. but, I mean, this is Valentine's Day, right? Yes. So the romance of love. What, and the glamour what is, of it, right? Well, well, talk so, a little bit about what does that mean, the glamour? Yeah, because I think it's also where her, her influence, although not always recognized, lived on deep into the 20th century is this... Um, you know, one of the things that I make a lot of in Three Weeks, which is that, that book I was mentioning, the one that gets her kicked out of British society, you know, she spends like two thirds of this novel on the seduction, <laughs> right? And so, and, and what, what, and it's, it's the tale, right, of an older, more, much more sexually experienced woman picking this younger man and, you know, having a three week affair with him and schooling him essentially to be the perfect lover that she has not had from her husband. You know, of course, it turns out that she's a queen and, you know, her husband is a mad king and she's traveling incognito and has to go back to him. But um, in any case, this, this love affair is a lot of it is about the details. It's about the right ambiance and the right clothes and the right things to drink and the right things to read. And this, you know, very um, deliberate orchestration of a kind of slow buildup, right? And teaching him so much of the sexual practice, if you will, that this lady, and that's what she's called, right, offers her young pupil, is about taking it slow, learning to talk, right? I mean, it's, and it is about, it's, it's adding more romance, more time, more glamor to the sexual act, essentially which only the leisured upper class right. would be able to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so her family. She mm. has two children and a mother who plays a large role in her life. How did they react to the notoriety that Eleanor's books began so interesting. to bring to their That's lives? That's a really interesting question. I have only... I don't have any letters that her mother wrote to her, but I had like a th more than a thousand letters that she wrote to her mother. You know, she wrote constantly to her mother. Um, it's, it's a complicated question to answer because on the one hand, her, her financial success as a writer supported her family um, from the time her children were fairly small, right? Her husband gambled and drank his fortune away, like many people of that era. It, he didn't have that big a fortune to begin with, it turned out. And so part of why she keeps also publishing books and perhaps also making them sexier and sexier is that she does realize audiences like this and she needs to make money. Um, you know, her, so her family depends on her. 
on the one hand, and that's quite clear, you know, in the, the chapter that I have on family fortunes, when they come out, there's definitely, they come out to Hollywood, her daughter and son-in-law, who's her age, right, like 35 years older than the daughter. Um, and, you know, they're trying to cash in on, on her celebrity, you know, and fame at this point. So, for, and for some understandable reasons, right? Things are hard in Britain. Um, things are really good in America. But at the same time, I mean, a refrain in her letters is that she never felt appreciated. She never felt like anyone in her family really ever said to her, like, great job, mom. Thanks for, you know, keeping us all in our fancy schools and, and sending us on those trips. Or, you know, because they lived in a lavish style, these folks, that they right. really could barely afford. And she's the one that kept them in that style for many, many years. And yet, as far as I can tell, like just from some of the self-pitying comments, frankly, that she makes, you know, she says something about a, she, you know, she says something about a medium. This is when she was living in Paris during World War I and sort of, you know, re reporting on the war. She talks about a medium that she had in Paris who told her that it was her karma, essentially, that no one in her family would ever give her the honors that she wanted. <laughs> Poor Nell. <laughs> Nell is what she was called by her family. Yeah. Uh, uh, bef before we move on to Hollywood, which I want to do in a minute, I just want to go to take a look at the war with you, because here we see a picture of a Nell Gwynn who's really um, not so interested in making money, but mm -hmm. is interested in becoming a kind of advocate of both the wartime, the cause of the war, mm -hmm. but also of the poor, the soldiers, mm -hmm. for example, who participate in the war. This mm -hmm. is a Nell we haven't seen before. Yes. How does that happen? Yeah, I mean, that was perhaps the biggest surprise in actually writing the book was not realizing how important that window, these uh, little less than two years that she spent in Paris during World War I w was in her life. Because I don't think she would have prospered in Hollywood in the same way had she not had this more sort of democratizing experience. You know, she's giving speeches to hundreds and sometimes thousands of enlisted men that are like pouring through Paris on their way to you know the front. She's visiting hospitals constantly. She's dealing with refugees. She's on this committee to help refugees and dealing with that constantly. She goes to the front and she reports on that because they want famous writers to you know draw people's attention to the suffering you know. And she's very well known at this point, especially in the United States, you know, and people really want the United States to, you know, support the war effort. So she really takes on an, an entirely different role that isn't connected to, I mean, she talks at one point, she writes a letter where she says, I don't feel like I'm a man or a woman anymore. I feel like I'm a third sex. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really revolutionary for her, right, to sort of, and it had this moment anyway, you know, everyone, but I think especially for women, you know, all of her roles had been so gender defined. And I think this was this window when she sort of stepped outside that box a little bit for the first time. But then she immediately after the war decides that she wants to make money. Yeah. And she returns to her sexual themes and that's when she goes off to Hollywood. Yeah. So do you think the World War one experience was just a glitch? A, a glitch. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, no, I, I do think it changed her. I think that the kinds of people that start to show up in her work and the kinds of protagonists, she starts to have people that are not just aristocrats. I mean, it's still aristocrat heavy, but um, it changes that dimension of, of her work a little bit. I think it does, like another quote that I love, you know, she's writing to her mother when she's already in Los Angeles at this point, maybe after she's been working there a couple years. And, you know, she would complain about various things about, you know, maybe we'll go into that about people in LA, but she really liked it there. And she, she really made friends with a lot of people very quickly. And she, so she writes to her mother, you know, I I've, I've figured out basically, I'm paraphrasing, that I really get along only with aristocrats from all countries and the low classes who work. They're really just as good as the aristocrats. 
Mm-hmm. And I do think that that, like the war, like she gained a new respect for working people. Right. You know, and one of her problems, honestly, with the aristocracy, and particularly the men, was that she did think a lot of them didn't really work enough. Right? right? And her husband would have been an example of that, obviously. Um, right. So... I think it did change her, and I also think it changed her in the sense that she realized that essentially she needed to work to be happy, and she was no longer embarrassed about that. Right. And so when she got a new opportunity, she was going to take it, because she didn't want, she knew she was getting older, you know, by that point she was 56 when the war ended. You know, she'd been dumped by her lover, her husband had died, you know, and I think, yes, I think the war taught her, like, seize the opportunities, because that's where your happiness lies, and, you know. But, of course, the fact that the husband, who was a gambler and who gambled away a lot of what she earned, had died before the end of the war, freed her in some sense to Absolutely. become visibly in other words she could be making money before but it had somehow to be hidden within the family yeah that's true but after the war she becomes uh, but that raises another question about hollywood did she go to hollywood to make money because she knew there was money there to be made or Mm -hmm. did she go to hollywood because she thought film was a way of the cinema which was still silent film and in its early stages Mm -hmm. was a way of expanding the audience for her idea of romantic love I don't think it's an either or (laughs) you know I mean I I really think Eleanor definitely went to make money Um, you know she was uh, she did not have a lot of money at that point she writes to her mother about needing to make enough money so she can retire and settle down um, so definitely that was part of the, the motivation. But I also, she loved the American West, you know, when she had gone there before. This was a woman that loved to travel. This was one of the funnest parts of the book for me was, you know, figuring out all the interesting places she went. Um, and, you know, I think she did not really understand the movies that much, but I do think by 1920, when she goes to Los Angeles, no one in any city can miss the giant lines of people, you know, waiting to get into movie theaters and the fact that a new art or something is being born that suddenly more people are interested in than any other kind of amusement that anyone's ever seen before. So, you know, I think, you couldn't miss that. And so I think, you know, as you said, I think she is, this is the moment, her third act, where she's the most um, openly ambitious, <laughs> you know? And so I do think she thought, you know, you know, I, this is a new, something new here is really important is happening. And, you know, I think the war gave her a lot of confidence in her ability to speak to just about anybody. Mm. You know, it was a much bigger audience and much different kinds of people suddenly she was talking to um, in all the work she did in Paris during the war. So I think that confidence also, she was like, sure, I'll give this a try. Um, when she, I mean, she was invited to go there. I mean, would she have just gone there without the lavish invitation? Right. Probably not. But, you know. She, but tell us then a little bit about her rapid sort of rise and fall in, yeah. in Hollywood. In other words, she goes around 1919 by 1927, 28, it's all over. And yeah. she retires and comes back. And in that period, she makes brilliant or she participates in making brilliant movies on the one hand, and on the other hand, she's roundly disliked by other movie makers, the producers, and so on. Can you? I mean, I think that's a little, I mean, she she's not roundly disliked at first. Um, I, right. I do think that part of what happens there is the intervention of her family has a lot of unfortunate side effects when they come a little bit more in the middle of the decade. But the first few years in the early 20s when she's there, I mean, I think people, many people write about finding her intimidating. And and some people are somewhat frightened by her. She's literally the oldest person in Hollywood. 
um, you know, she's 56 when she arrives, and it's a very young industry, uh, the men and the women. And so, and she's almost, with the exception maybe of William Randolph Hearst, one of the few people in that milieu who's actually been to Europe and seen the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard to really capture, you know, how quickly the American film industry became this thing called Hollywood. You know, I mean, it really happens in a few years and the people that suddenly have more money and more attention on them than maybe anybody's ever had, you know, really have done one thing. They're young and they've worked in one industry mostly their whole lives, maybe theater and then film usually, right? But they're not experienced, sophisticated people of the world like Eleanor Glenn. And so, you know, as this industry is trying to sort of, you know, after World War I, again, when all the other film industries are mostly decimated, the American film industry gets a giant shot of adrenaline like most American businesses, and, you know, it explodes. And she's, she's like a person initially that people are really depending on to help them navigate you know, on the one hand, a lot of young fans who want sexy stories on the screen, and on the other hand, a whole nativist, moralist, reformer movement that is very upset about sexy stories on screen and very upset about all the immigrants in this industry that are, you know, producing these sexy stories on screen and their so-called effect on American culture. So she is very, remember, right, she's an extremely elegant, British woman with an impeccable upper class ac accent. And, you know, she's dressed by her older sister, who was, you know, literally the most famous British couturier of the Edwardian period. So she's, she's, you know, she's extremely, she was like, mm -hmm. the, as I was saying, those secondary sources that tried to mock her, she was not mockable. I mean, she was impeccable. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, um, a lot of her power derived from that, from, you know, the self-confidence she had essentially in her own taste. Right. <laughs> in her own taste and her sister's clothes. Yes, so yes, we, yes. We missed that part, but it is one of the most <laughs> intriguing parts of the book that her sister becomes a yes. very famous designer and dresses her. That, from childhood. So that she can actually play the role that she wants to play. Yes, yes. Let me ask you one last question, Hillary, before we turn to questions. Um, you say in the book, uh, you say that here was a woman, Eleanor Glynn, who changed the destinies of millions of people. Uh, would you Did still... Did I say destiny? Destiny Dreams? is the word. No, is it I destiny? think destiny. Okay, I can probably it find it for you. But <laughs> okay, you would know probably better would than you, I would. Would else. you still <laughs> stick to that? The would destiny. You? I mean, I guess. I mean, so I was literally. I just said this. I have two sons, and they didn't know until fairly recently that I am a person that really believes in um, the power. Like, the, you know, the idea that if you, you encourage people to have their dreams, that that is um, part of, you know, one of the more important things that you can do. I write a lot about the importance of fantasy and dreams, you know, to opening up people's worldviews. And so I guess destiny is a little strong of a word, I will admit. <laughs> um, I, 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 but that's what I guess I meant more, right? Mm. That I get, I, and this is also, you have to remember, coming from the perspective of, we all know F. Scott, F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, for good reason, I'm a fan. Um, but his ideas, let's say, just of the 1920s, um, have stood in often until recently, you know, they're all many people know, mm -hmm. you know, and in terms of the absolute number of people that, you know, were affected by someone's stories, Eleanor Glenn was far more influential than F. Scott Fitzgerald. She broke censorship codes far more than he did, mm -hmm. right? She withstood a level of, you know, criticism and, you know, challenge that he didn't, I mean, most of his challenges we know were self-inflicted. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I guess that's what I, I mean, I guess part of it is that effort to yeah. reclaim her, I believe, rightful influence over culture. 
And she also, in some sense, gave women the right to feel, or the women who wanted to feel as though they could enjoy sex, yes. they could be their own person. Yes. And she legitimized. She legitimized it. That, which is a... And she made it seem cool. I mean, that wasn't a word then, exactly, yet, but right? She made it seem, you know, glamorous, really, which is the, the right. word, right? And then that made it more acceptable. Right. She smoothed away. And like a flapper, she loved to dance. Yes, I she like did. that part of it. <laughs> yeah, me <Jesus>. too. <laughs> All right, questions from the audience. I'm just going to take these as they come to me. Uh, why isn't Eleanor Glynn as well known as some other women novelists from this period? Did her work fall out of favor at a particular point? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I am not going to make the case that her novels are, I, I, there's a, two or three that I highly recommend, but I, the, yeah, I make this clear in my introduction. I'm not trying to res resurrect her as a major uh, literary stylist, let's say, right? Um, I think that what's interesting about some of her books, though, are the window, again, it gives you into, you know, very early pictures of women struggling with these issues about sexual desire. Um, I remember, you probably won't remember this, Alice, but, you know, early on in this, telling you about three weeks, and you were like, what year was it published? And I was like, 1907. Right. I, I could hardly believe it. Right. And she could hardly believe it, you right. know? And, yeah. I then went out and bought it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Barbara Cartland, a lot of super, super famous 20th century romance writers admit that they were her acolytes, right? The generation that comes up in the 20s and 30s is very, very proud to claim her influence. But it does kind of then drop away, I would say somewhere around the 50s. Mm. Um, and, I mean, it's still true that her romantic aesthetic shapes the mise-en-scene of, of some of what counts as glamorous sex today. Right. But um, I, it's, it's hard to say why. I just, I think it's a combination of, books did get more explicit too, to be honest, right? I mean, the books that she was writing for their day were very explicit about sex and sexual desire, but today they don't, you have to know the time period in, in part to understand what's so you think it's also possible that the depression of the 1930s, I mean, she left yes. before that happened. Yes. But Aristocrats also, British culture isn't, it becomes like an interesting little slice of the kinds of stories that people want to hear about, whereas in the early 20th century when the British Empire was at the center of everything, those aristocrats, everybody wanted to read books about them. And so I do think, you know, this is where her own sort of subject specialty isn't as in favor after, in the Depression, obviously. People want to read about very different kinds of people, so right. yes. Here's another question. It's always interesting to imagine the subjects of biographies reading over the shoulder of the biographer. Hmm. What do you think Eleanor Glynn would think of your book? <laughs> oh, I have wondered that. I do not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, but I fondly, really actually fondly hope that she would. I mean, I don't want to be her defender but I didn't feel like she'd had a properly respectful biography, and I hope she would feel like this was that. I, that's a nice answer. In writing about such an interesting life, how do you decide how much detail to include and yeah. which details? That is one of the hardest things. You know, I say that to my students all the time, that knowing what to leave out of writing is sometimes half the trick. Um, I'm someone that tends to amass more detail than I can usually use. And so, you know, over time, I have learned to cut down on that up front because I, I, you know, you've learned. But it's hard, right? You want to find the details that, to me, you know, reveal something specific about the person or that really give you the, the various people because she knew so many interesting people. 
um, or about the place. To me, that's often what I'm looking for um, are, you know, just those, those, those gems that really help you, the reader, get inside the minds a little bit or the character of the person, the various characters of the book. Um, and also, I got really into describing the places that she went because she was a big believer in not ever actually writing about some place you haven't been. This was one of her rules as a writer that you had to actually go there to write about it. And I could not do that. <laughs> but like the New York Public Library helped me with this. You know, when I was writing this part that's set in Cairo, where I've never been, it had, you know, there's so many historical maps here, you know, from the period that she was there and various sources that were very helpful, at least in me trying to imagine it when she was there which, you know, even if I went to Cairo today, it's an incredibly different place than what it was like 100 years ago or more, really, when she was there. So it's those things that help a place or the people really kind of come, al come alive is what are the details that I try to keep in, I guess. One of the intriguing things in the book is the way you trace her various trips, mm -hmm. um, you know, from uh, London to Southampton to Paris to Venice to wherever else she goes next. And you think, doesn't she ever get tired of all this <laughs> I traveling? Know. I know. She's often traveling with her children and nanny and the husband who disappears and goes gambling. She loves it. She loves it. I mean, she was I can never bring indefatigable. Um, she just never seemed tired by travel. Wonderful. Almost. Yeah. So the trove of letters in the trunk that you used as primary sources, were these copies of letters that Eleanor Glynn kept for herself? Were they letters others had written to her or letters that she... So the va and it's an assortment. The the biggest single cachet of stuff were letters that she wrote to her mother um, over the course of basically her entire life, almost because they were so often not in the same place. Um, and you know there were other letters. They were mostly letters that she wrote. There were a few letters from other family members that were included. It was kind of hard to figure out, honestly, why what had been saved had been saved. I mean, I think that there was a deliberate culling of some of the diaries. Mm. I also know that there Cull was... A deliberate culling by Ellen Glynn I herself. think by her daughter. By her daughter. I think by her daughter, Juliet, and who married the man who owned the house in Wales, right? So it was Juliet's husband's house, and it was Juliet's granddaughter that brought me these. Juliet was her younger daughter, Eleanor Nell's younger daughter. And so I think that there had been some culling. I know there had also been a fire in the house in Wales, and some things had been destroyed. And so I don't know, but it seems like then everything that remained got put into this trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like the various things that remained, and I'm not exactly sure why, because it wasn't complete, you know, certainly of every letter she'd ever written or received, and I know she kept many more diaries than I ended up with. Mm. So I, but yeah, that's what the trunk was. It was a lot of, a lot of, you know, maybe five or six diaries, thousands of letters with her mother, to her mother, um, so her mother must have saved those letters. Her mother saved those letters, clearly. Because right. her mother also lived in Juliet's house in Wales. Right. What wonderful luck to find so mm -hmm. many letters. Yeah. What wonderful yeah, luck. Yeah, it really was. And to share them with me. You know. Yeah. So last question from the audience. As a writer and biographer, did you like Eleanor Glynn? Mm. Would you like to have met her? I would love to have met her. Um... You know, that was a question that I worried about a little bit, uh, especially, honestly, because, you know, so I'm an Americanist by training, and, you know, I was a little nervous about, I'm not, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, and I'm a Democrat with a small D as well as with a big D, and I, I kind of worried that I wouldn't be able to, uh, like, like aristocrats, I'll be honest. I've never had a thing for British ar the aristocrats, never been into it. And so, and you know, the first couple of great house, great houses, you all know what I'm talking about, right? They're not houses. 
<laughs> their palaces, you know, they're insane. I mean, honestly, I was just like these, it's, it's, you know, but over time I did really come to admire her. I don't know about like, but I don't think we expect to like men just for starters most of the time. You know, I think that women, we have a narrower range. I don't know if I would have liked her, but I tried to just put that aside. And I, and it just, I know I found her really fascinating and um, I know I found her, I, I grew to really admire her. So uh, admiration is the yeah. key here. Yeah, and I did. That's, I did grow to admire her. Right, she's a woman who made it on her own. Yes. So let me ask you one final question yeah. before we have to close. If, if the book gets a wide readership, which I hope it will, what do you think people will learn from it? I mean, how do you think they will, in the end, assess the importance of Eleanor Glynn, who you've so effectively brought back to life? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope first, you know, one of my longer standing efforts is to make people aware of just how important not just Eleanor Glynn was, but a lot of women were in, you know, developing Hollywood. It's not a story that still most people are really aware of. And scholars, not just myself, many others at this point, you know, have been working on this for, you know, about a generation now. And still, I mean, I, I will say Babylon, not a great mo movie by many people's estimations, but I was happy to see, you know, and wrote about this for Slate, that it was more historically accurate in many ways um, than any other movie about early Hollywood. And one of the ways that it was, right, was that it did show a lot of women directing yes. and doing other things as they did. Um, and so that's part of what I hope they'll learn. Um, you know, just that women have been more influential in our cultural past than I think that they're given credit for. I think we often think of culture as something that objectifies women, which it does. But, you know, women have been, you know, very influential in, in, in other ways besides being objectified. And so sort of, you know, um, bringing that back into public consciousness, I think, is important. I also just, she lives on still in the sort of so much of the ethos of the romantic aesthetic of glamour. And I think she deserves broader recognition for that. Mm. You know, that this really um, eccentric and odd but charming, you know, British lady managed to like make sex into something that people could, you know, talk about. And, you know, women have, you know, like you were saying, the idea that women had strong sexual desires was not something people talked about, right. you know. And by the time she leaves the scene, it's like, you know, that Pandora's box is, has been opened. Right. Though, of course, she leaves the scene just at the time that Freud and... Yes, other people try to <laughs> nose it down. Well, so that's the other thing. I say this a lot, and I know you would appreciate this, that history doesn't move in a straight line. And I think right. people need to remember that, you know, that, there, that things were better for some women in any way in the beginning of the 20th century, certainly white women in yeah. some ways, and then they would be again in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yes, right. Better for some... Well, thank you, Hillary yeah. Hallett. This is a wonderful you, book. Alice. I want to show everybody the book again, and to, uh, especially for people who are watching this online, it's worth reading and it's worth buying, and it's a great read. So thank you. Thank you, Hillary, and thanks for introducing it to us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.